Good afternoon, everybody. We'll welcome you in to this, uh, this next up town hall. It's been a little while since we've seen, seen each other. Uh, my name is Jeremy Goldberg. I'm the president and quarterback at League Apps, uh, and we're excited to have this conversation about local government and youth sports, uh, navigating all the kinds of regulations and challenges, liability questions about what's happening these days, especially in the context of the pandemic. So lots of great stuff to get into. Uh, we'll let everyone get settled. I know there's a lot of demand for, for today, and, uh, and, and we'll jump in. Um, first thing I, I want to start before we, we get into the kind of uh, formal discussion is to help you all understand, I think, why this topic is so important, why it's relevant. Um, and either you already understand it, uh, and this will confirm that understanding, or you don't, but you're going to figure out soon why this matters. And I think the first thing is, as we've seen uh, in the context of this pandemic, in the context of COVID, government is mattering like never before and its role and impact on youth sports. Whether that's the decision to issue permits or not, whether that's creating all kinds of rules and restrictions about how you might operate, or the kinds of programs or experiences you might offer, no one can question the role or impact the government might have in the way that you're operating your organizations, right? This also includes, for example, whether play spaces are open or not, or, um, what's happening with park and municipality. So everybody in the sector can be impacted by that. Now, some people might be saying, well, wait a second, I have my own facility, I have access to my own space, so do I have to care as much? And this is actually a really important thing because what a lot of insurance companies will do is they'll hold you to a liability standard based on what the government policy are, is for your given area. So if the government said, hey, we're not sure it's safe, so therefore we're not gonna offer permits or giving access to fields, then if you are running your programs in the context of that environment, then you are opening yourself up to potential liability because you're doing something that, that could be then argued would be unsafe later on if someone wanted to, to accuse you of that. So, so this is something that matters to everybody, whether you think you're directly impacted or not. And beyond just the COVID window, right, which, which obviously all of us are still contending with and thinking about, there is actually a broader op opportunity, a broader conversation right now about uh, what can happen uh, with government and whether it's the national, the state, the local level, and ultimately how that can influence the way that we can actually make this the sector even better and more effective with more kids in it. Um, just as an example, uh, recently, the government passed the Great American Outdoors Act. It was last month. What you might not know about that act was that it reauthorized the fund for the Land, Water, and Conservation Fund, uh, and up to $900 million a year could be reinvested in annual grounds and things that support outside recreation. It was this very fund that created a huge number of the public play spaces all around the country. And now there's actually an opportunity for those investments to happen again. It is a massive example of where government's coming in that could have an impact on this sector. And as, as many of you may know, uh, League Apps and myself, Jeremy Goldberg, I'm the co-chair of the Play Sports Coalition. We're one of the founders of that, that group. We're spending a lot of time thinking about what government can do. We're still fighting for, for short-term relief that I'm still optimistic will pass despite the dysfunction in Washington these days to hopefully help organizations that are really struggling. But more importantly, we're really envisioning as a coalition what the future looks like and how we can bring this industry together to continue to advocate for things that are important to all of us to make sure all kids have access to great experiences in the institution and the sector is strong. Uh, and we're collaborating closely with the Aspen Institute now as part of that. We were recently named as an Aspen Institute Project Play Champion. There's actually a summit ne next week that the Aspen Institute's ho hosting. Uh, of course, Tom Ferry and the team do a great job. And then actually every day, one of the things the Play Sport Coalition will be looking to do is to host conversations to apply this and really shape the legislative agenda moving forward. So right now, this time, there's so many reasons why government, government matters and the opportunities that exist. And I think the final thing I'll share is, is, is the, my personal passion perspective, and some people might say expertise in this topic as we jump in. And no, uh, this is not about my student council experience growing up in uh, middle school, although I did actually run for student body president. I was elected in seventh grade to, the, to, to that position. Uh, my head was on a penny and a poster, it said vote for Jeremy, it makes sense. Uh, but that's not what this is about. Uh, but I do have a perspective on why I think government can matter, where government can work. And there's a lot of reasons why we feel like it doesn't these days. My first experience exposure to government was when I worked for Se uh, Senator Dick Luger. He was a Republican from Indiana. Uh, I was an intern for nine months. One of my jobs was to hold the softball fields for the softball games. I also went running with them every day. Uh, that was one of the things that we were invited to do and really saw the power of public service. And when I worked in that office, even as an intern, I saw you could actually help people like veterans navigate government services that really made a huge impact on people's lives. I later ended up working for a mentee of Dick Luger. That was Barack Obama on the Obama campaign. And I actually saw the power of community organizing. What happens when people come together and the kind of change that can happen? So I do think that there's a power that we have when we come together to interact with government, right? Whatever you might think of government, 
to ultimately make sure it's helping us accomplish what we want, which is that every, every child has an amazing sports experience, right? Everybody has access to amazing sports experiences. And so that's what today is about. So we've got an incredible panel. Before we jump in, I do wanna do a little housekeeping. We've got this Q and A tab. So if you've got questions, feel free to submit questions into that. People can kind of upvote those. Um, so I'll have a sense of things that you wanna talk about and I'll integrate that into the conversation. Um, we also uh, will um, we'll post some messages in the chat tool. Uh, and uh, afterwards, we can continue the conversation on the industry Slack group where you can find information on how to sign up in that chat as well. Um, lastly, uh, we're gonna throw up a poll really quick because I think one of the things we're trying to understand is ultimately where are you at and ways that we can continue to work together within the industry to be helpful. So I'm curious to know if, if anyone out there is it planning on attending uh, the, your, your sports virtual sports convention this winter. As many of you know, all the conventions have now gone online. So whether it's the ABCA for baseball or the ABCA for volleyball or uh, uh, the lacrosse convention or the soccer convention, the USCC, uh, are you planning on attending them? So go ahead and take two seconds to indicate that. If you're attending a convention that I didn't mention, there's obviously others, uh, go ahead and indicate that as well. So take uh, 20 seconds to do that. Uh, and while we do that, I'm gonna invite uh, Skip Gilbert to jump in and, uh, and join the conversation. So Skip, welcome, uh, welcome to the conversation. Well, thanks, Jeremy. It's great to be here and appreciate the invitation. Uh, well, first, I'll, I'll say that, uh, you know, you are the CEO of US, USU Soccer. Uh, you're also a retired soccer player yourself. There are trophies in the background, some of which you may have won, some of which you might be in charge of getting up. But nonetheless, uh, we obviously know uh, of, of uh, your track record, both as a leader and I've heard as a, an All-American goalkeeper at University of Vermont, go Catamounts. Uh, and certainly, uh, I know you played professionally for, for the NAS NASL. Um, and, uh, and you also have worked across lots of different governing bodies. So you bring a, a, a lens of kind of a, a broad perspective of what's happening within soccer and youth sports nationally. So the first thing I'll say is uh, from the lens that you see both for youth soccer and youth sports, uh, how, how is COVID and especially government decisions right now impacting um, this sector? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. And I will say full disclosure, the trophies behind me are national championship trophies. None of them are mine, we give them out. So, um, but that being said, we didn't give any of them out this year. And that was because for the most part, the country as we all know was shut down. Um, and what we're trying to do right now is to get back into full competitive mode safely, you know, in a focused manner, state by state, county by county, city by city, you know, all the way down into the local communities. And what we're finding right now is, is that in some states, it's going very well. You know, you get states like Indiana, New York, and a bunch of others that, you know, are doing it all in the right way. And then there are a number of states where you kind of scratch your head and says, and you say, I don't understand this. You know, case in point, we had, as of two weeks ago, you couldn't play at all in the state of New Mexico, yet they're playing in New York City you know, which was at one point a, a pretty, you know, hotbed for the virus. So what we're trying to do and the voice that we're trying to have heard is that across the entire political landscape, have some consistency. We all want our kids to get out there and play in a safe environment because that opens up the door to part two of the equation. One, we have to let the kids play, but two, we have to manage the expectations of the parents. Are they comfortable in what's going on when their kid leaves their car and walks out onto the field to play, returns to the car and gets home? And so the, the intersection of those two dynamics, you know, makes it a little bit confusing, but still we need to have that consistency across the board. Yeah, so before we go into why there's not this consistency, because as you said, I've observed the same thing. It doesn't seem that you can really understand the rhyme or reason of how some of the decisions are being reached. Um, is, uh, is what are the implications of this, right? Because of the lack of consistency, the fact that some people are able to play in some areas and not others and what's going on. How, how serious of an issue is this right now for youth soccer, for youth sports? You know, it's more of a, it's an issue on youth sports in general. And the studies are now starting to come out that if you take an individual and they're sitting at home for six months and sure, you know, the, in soccer, they might be juggling in the lawn, in the, in the living room, you know, they might be hitting it against the kitchen wall, diving over couches, you know, whatever they're doing. But the reality is it's not a training session. And so the impact on our muscular skeletal system is certainly going to be significant. The impact on our mental health and well-being is going to be significant. And so when you put all of that together, you know, you absolutely want the kids to be able to get out there. The other element, and I think the, our friends at um, Aspen Institute just let this um, release this week, is that the 30% of the kids that were playing sports a year ago 
have, because of the time off, have decided that they're not going to play sports. And the implications, and you'd mentioned it at the top, insurance companies. Think about a sedentary lifestyle community. You know, the impact it has on, on drugs, on hospitals, on doctors, you know, all of that coming together to keep us in, sh you know, in shape, in medical shape. And sports has such a great way to keep us in that health and wellness mindset. You know, we like to say part of our vision is to bring the power of, of soccer, to bring communities together to make lifelong fans of the sport. We don't want kids just to play up until they're 18 or 19 and then go do what they want. We'd love for them to be involved with the game as a fan, as a player, as a referee, as a coach through their entire life. It keeps them healthier. It keeps their mental you know, health up. So not being able to do any of this has almost catastrophic effects for the community and for the next generation coming through. Yeah, it's, it's such a good point. Uh, you know, and, and to your point about the lifelong, um, the, the lifelong exposure and what that's like. I, I think about Jamie who works with the Men of League Apps team and the importance that adult sports can have. She, when I was interviewing her, she, was, she played in five soccer leagues. And I thought it was an exaggeration, right? She literally plays in five soccer leagues. And uh, it's, uh, it's the passion and the relationships that the community that creates around it is it's powerful. What, what is the, it's it, what happens to organizations if they're not able to operate? What, what are you seeing the risk to youth sports organizations if they can't run programs right now, assuming there's a, there's a safe way to do so in their area? I, the, the organizations are doing whatever they can to almost keep the lights on. You know, a lot of times you say just in, in families, you're kind of living paycheck to mouth. Um, organizations, a lot of the smaller organizations are the same way. They live registration to mouth. And so if they don't have that registration income, they can't pay the coaches. They can't rent out the fields. They can't keep their lights on. So, you know, from our perspective, being able to keep those organizations somehow engaged, and a lot of them have done some great things, staying connected to the kids so that they can do things at home. You know, they can go and dribble around the furniture or get outside if they have a backyard to be able to do certain things. And that's just not in soccer. That's across all sports. So, you know, it, it comes down to that, you know, it's that seesaw. That, that we have, where on one seat, you have the financial implications. On the other side is the health implications. And if all you care about is the money, well, the health is gonna be at the very top, you know, it's gonna be actually at the bottom and it's gonna be devastating for the kids. If all you care about is the kids and keep them at home, the devastation, the seesaw is gonna go the other way. And now all of a sudden it's the clubs that are gonna be impacted. So we're trying to find that, that balance and that's yeah. really what it comes down to is, can we find that balance so that the kids are in a safe environment, but they're also getting back to normal? And I think that's yeah. what we all want is to be able to get back to normal. Yeah, it's it's such a good point. And I think one thing to underscore uh, for our audience and, and all those that will, will see this is that, uh, you know, there was already challenges and questions around participation in new sports before we went into COVID. And people that are really committed, uh, families that are really committed and invested uh, they're just they're they're eager to get back and hopefully in some areas that are allowed to happen and you're saying there's some variability that we'll talk about but then there are a lot of people that were kind of in the middle they weren't sure if they want to stick with it um you know they're they're kind of on, on the fence their experience may have been okay whatever else and those people there's a huge risk that they don't come back and so uh, and especially when you think about lower income communities underserved communities uh, where they don't have access to the same space where there's transportation where they've they've, they've had magnified kind of implications to covid uh, there's a real risk that that, that gap widens even more and we'll, we'll hear later on some incredible organizations that are that are that are trying to address that. So so many so many reasons why this is so important. So what what's the root of the issue here? Like why 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 is there such variability? And what are you trying to do about it? Along with other national governing bodies and, and all those that are kind of getting behind this. Effort? Sure. And and the variability is is that there's no playbook. You know we've never been through this as a as a global community. And so we're really almost flying by the seat of our pants. And for a lot of political leaders, some of them are, are looking at their science leaders. Some of them are just going by intuition um, and then everything in between. And so we realize that the only way to really at attack that is to say to the political leaders, hey, you're making really tough decisions. We're here to help. And I can put a letter, just like everybody else on the, on the panel, we can put information in front of them and say, oh, it's from Skip Gilbert, U.S. Youth Soccer. Well, the reality is if we have something like that, how much more powerful is, is it from my counterparts at U.S. Lacrosse, U.S.A. Swimming, US, U.S.A. Volleyball, Track and Field, Baseball, Hockey, Football. So we put that letter together with all of these organizations to say, 
we, many of these organizations as the national governing bodies were empowered by Congress to oversee the sport in this country. Let us do our jobs. Let us help you create a scenario where the kids were, and not just kids, but adults, everybody can get back to participatory sport in a logical, meaningful, and safe environment. And so use our resources, use our websites. You know, we'll come together with a task force with some of the best medical personnel, the CDC, everybody that, that you can come down and say, you know what, that makes logical sense. Let's create a formula so that we know that if it's X, well, kids can practice. If it's Y, kids can play. And if it's Z, nobody's doing anything. You know, because again, the last thing in the world that we want to have happen is for us to get out there, to get the trust of the political leaders, get the trust of the parents, and then mess it up. And then suddenly yeah. kids are home sick, getting sick, their families are getting sick, and we're, we've lost everything. So we're not going to do that, but we're going to do it the right way. And that's all we're asking. Our, our, so I know there's a petition. We'll go ahead and post that in the, in the chat tool so people can see that as you're, you're trying to mobilize people around this to call attention to this. Are, um, is it working? Like I know it's early on, but like are, are people listening and how can people help call attention to this. It, it, it's all about talk. And yes, it is, it is actually working. Um, our state association up in Alaska was at a point where they were getting frustrated because they could practice but couldn't play. They took the letter, they put it on their letterhead. They had a number of the local sport communities come together and the mayor said, you know what, you're right, let's do this. So they went from practice to now full competition and it was a win. So it, you know, if you can do it in one city, it's gonna be able to happen a around the country. And it just takes time. And we launched this two weeks ago, you know, and as they say, you can't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, you know, nor was every kid allowed to play in a day. So we're getting there, but it's just slow. And the more help we can get to draw attention to this ask, um, the better off we'll all be. Are there, um, are there any models out there that you think you're looking at, whether it's state or local level or certain kind of approaches that you're like, hey, this, this seems to be the right approach as you all come, want to bring in those experts together? Is there anything that you're currently pointing to as saying uh, this is something that makes a lot of sense to us? You know, I, I had mentioned Indiana and New York doing it. You know, they're, it's fact-based. And, and a lot of times they're looking at the COVID data. You know, they have a dashboard and it shows the percentages of population that, that, has, been, that has tested positive, you know, and those trends. And, and so that, I think, you know, in Indiana, I think is doing the same thing. And then I'm sure there are a bunch of others, um, but those two certainly come to mind. And, and literally what we're trying to do is to get medical personnel, CDC, and, you know, some the brain trust together to say, what should that formula be so that we can do it across all 50 states and eventually around the world if need be. But it's not so important now, but if all of the science is saying there might be round two of COVID as we get into the winter months, we want to make sure that if that does happen, that everybody is talking from the same, you know, uh, a playbook to be able to guide their their states accordingly. So, uh, Skip, a uh, final question. You know, it's it's great to see the kind of unified effort that's happening across the governing bodies, and really, you all doing what you use best, which is using your voice, right? Using your the, the credibility and authority that you have. But I think what I'm also hearing from you is that it, it that what also happens is all ultimately what happens at the local level, at the city level or at the state level. You gave that example for Alaska. So if you were going to kind of invite the people that are listening here um, and to think about like, what is the way they can partner and align with what you're doing? It feels like the governing bodies are going to create some air cover, right? They're going to be advocating the way you're advocating. We can help try to draw attention to that. But there's also a really important place for how people are collaborating across sport using that example at the local level. A absolutely. And it really does have to start at the local level. So you, within your club, get your club and all of the other soccer clubs, but then reach out to football, baseball, basketball, hockey, so that there is some sort of a consensus so that the politicians know that it's not just one sport, it is the community. You know, I mean, Nelson Mandela said it right best, you know, sports bring communities together. Um, and this would be a great example of that. And then very nicely, you know, take, take a letter, get, try to get a, a meeting if you can, or at least say, read this, go to our websites, go to our national governing body websites, go to our state association websites. But there's a lot of people that have a very strong vested interest in this. And the more people that you can get to, you know, your local politicians, your county commissioners, your sport commissions, you know, there's a lot of people there that want to help. You know, nobody doesn't, I, I can't imagine anybody that's sitting there going, I don't want kids to ever play again, 
or I don't want adults to be able to go out and play, you know, in five different, uh, you know, teams, you know, they want to, but they want to make sure that if they're going right, to right. take that step, that it's not going to come back and hurt them. That's right. And I, I think one thing that's also important to, to, to emphasize here is uh, this is not about compromise safety, right? Each state has to take the facts that they have and determine what's best for them. And any organization that's running any kind of program has to take on that responsibility and the expectations to follow the CDC guidelines or the, the, the guidance that they might be getting from their governing bodies. I'll invite people, you can also go to the Play Sports Coalition. We've actually compiled all of the different kind of policies across all the different sports that are being used. So it, it, this isn't a question of love, trying to push people to do something they're not, but it's really helping to make sure that, that everyone is making that decision with the best information in mind. And what you often see, and unfortunately, sometimes this happens with the government, is they're not thinking things through. They're not realizing, wait a second, they're making this decision. It's actually disadvantaging the people that are most prepared to keep people safe, while actually still allowing people to play when they have no safeguards. So, so I think what you're trying to do is bring some rationality, some structure, some focus to it. And, and I just want to thank you on behalf of everyone within the youth sports industry for, for taking that lead. And uh, we'll go ahead and continue to circulate the, 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 the petition that you all are putting out there. I know as, as on behalf of both League Apps and Play Sports Coalition, uh, we're eager to do our part. So thanks so much, Skip. We appreciate you. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be giving out those trophies again soon. Perfect. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Sounds good. And I'm going to ask uh, Mike Masserman to join us in the conversation next. Now, we're working through some technical difficulties with Mike, but I could see him. He's here. <laughs> And uh, and a confession, I've known Mike for a long time. I've not I've not seen him in person for unfortunately a number of months. Uh, but uh, but I could not think of a better person in the world that I would go to on this very topic of ultimately how and what advice do we have about engaging local governments or governments at all level to try to influence the way they're thinking about things. Now I, I actually met Mike originally on the Obama campaign, but he's most recently the for, former head of global policy and social impact at Lyft. You all, most almost everybody here must know Lyft. Obviously, uh, uh, it's uh, the car uh, car service uh, and, and and car riding service. Uh, you know, uh, competitor to Uber. Some people would say better than Uber on this call. Uh, but but Lyft uh, and 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 those those companies had to go city by city, location by location, to try to get access and the ability to be able to kind of uh, uh, engage and, and be able to participate. He since subsequently left Lyft, and he is a senior advisor to the Albright Stonebridge Group. Uh, former Secretary of State uh, and an incredible group of public affairs professionals. So welcome, Mike, to the conversation. Thanks for joining us. Jeremy, great to be here. I should also point out you're a Michigan guy and as someone who goes to the University of Michigan, I've learned you pretty much all have to be obsessed with sports. It feels like a rule. So uh, it's, uh, it's excited for you to come here and, and speak about the intersection of both sports and policy today. Yes, well, third generation Michigan alum, uh, myself and all my brothers went there. So uh, yeah, really excited to, to be talking about this. It was great to, to hear um, what Skip had to say. So, um, so yeah. So here's, here's where I start with, which is, Mike, there's a crisis going on right now across the country, not just because of COVID, but specifically within the youth sports industry, where you have uh, in individual uh, cities, you have people that are trying to figure out how to get access to play spaces. Um, you got people that are trying to figure out how to get access to permits that may be canceled or not canceled with a lot of uncertainty. And so people are trying to figure out right now in response to that crisis, how to form and have the right kind of dialogue with local government officials and try to understand how they make decisions. And that's to say nothing about a longer term strategy about that kind of collaboration, which might lead to all kinds of new opportunities for them as well. So what are the things that you've learned from your time in government? I should also mention you served in the, in the Obama administration at the Commerce Department. Um, what did you learn about government, about connecting private sector and government? And ultimately, what is the, the, the ways to build successful relationship between local governments and companies or coalitions that are seeking their support? Well, I think first, Jeremy, there needs to be recognition that I think folks in government um, <clears throat> actually do want to help and they do want to collaborate. And there are structures built in such that, you know, change doesn't just happen overnight. And, and what I can tell you is that, first of all, change in any construct is hard. Change plus government, um, when you include regulations, becomes more complicated. And, in, you know, in the, um, in the lift example, you had change plus government, plus transportation regulations. And some of these regulations had not been updated in 50, 60, 70 years. And so, you know, right now we're in an era where I think people want governments to move extremely fast. And there needs to be, I think, a recognition that, you know, governments, you know, first and foremost is gonna be thinking about safety. And, and, you know, you and Skip were just talking about that. And so I think there needs to be, you know, I think compassion and empathy around, uh, around government officials on the one hand. You know, secondly, I think there needs to be a spirit and ethos of collaboration, not one in which, you know, one party says, hey, like, we're going to innovate, we're going to disrupt, and these people over here just aren't smart enough to keep up. It's not about that. It's actually about coming to the conversation with the notion that we're going to work together 
And we're going to figure out how to do this in a way that's going to elevate both the folks in government and the people in the private sector. And I think there also needs to be, you know, that spirit on the part of government where there is innovation that's happening. And there needs to be an acceptance that sometimes the way that things were are not the way that things have to be. And, you know, it might not happen overnight. You might not get all the regulations that you want overnight. But what I found to be really, really important was finding those right allies in those right cities um, where you have people who are open-minded, who are open to innovation, who uh, you know also obviously want to focus on safety. Um, you know, and 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 in your case with you know youth sports, safety is is very is really really important. You're talking about people's lives here. Um, and once you can get what we found is one pilot in one city where people can look to the, that example and say, hey, wow, you you know, for us, one of the very first places that we were able to have airport pick up and drop off at lift was in Nashville. And in Nashville, we were able to use this example of having a special designated area for the cars to pick up, working um, within the app to have the app geofence so that the airports are actually getting a fee. Uh, and it was a great experience. And other airports were able to look at Nashville and understand how did you do that? How did, you know, we, we were able to work with taxis and other types of yeah. stakeholders who there was this myth that, oh my God, all these horrible things are going to happen. But once you get that one example of collaboration, I, you know, you really can, can go from there. Yeah. So there, there's so much to unpack there and then translate that to your sports. I want to emphasize a few things that you said, and I think this is important. When you look at government, and I remember I saw the decision come down to ban permits in New York City, and we'll hear about that case study in a second. And I was like, look, this doesn't make any sense. You can still go play in the field, but the people that actually know how to play in the field with the safety and regulations aren't able to access it. And the people that are most disadvantaged are the folks for, that are coming from the most underserved communities. No one thought this through, right? But the, the second thing is, if you yell at government and say you guys are idiots, you're, you're going to immediately get this defensive reaction. So I think this idea of empathy and saying, wait, they're, they're trying to do their best. There's a lot of stuff coming at them. How do I approach this in the right way? And then the second thing is this idea of collaboration. I want you to elaborate a little bit on that theme. How do you think about creating that kind of collaboration? What were some of the tactics or approaches that you used as someone who was really good at that or with your team? Because, uh, you know, so that it's not seen as adversarial. What were the ways that you kind of build that kind of trust? Yeah, well, and before I talk about collaboration, you know, the New York example actually made me think about a Texas example in a city that you know well, which is Austin. And when ride sharing was actually banned in Austin, one of the unforeseeable consequences that we were trying to tell them was actually the increase in, um, in drunk driving. And, you know, in, in, in certain areas um, in Austin where public transit didn't connect folks, where taxis didn't service, where people didn't have cars, um, you actually saw an even greater uptick and people also were just stuck. We ha you have to think about transportation access and equity the same way you need to think about youth sports access and equity and the unforeseeable consequences of shutting down youth sports in different areas. And that's something I think that's really, really important. And it dovetails to the notion of collaboration, which is it's not just collaboration with policymakers and government officials, it's collaboration with different stakeholders on the ground. It's collaboration with all the different entities who have a vested interest in youth sports. It's collaboration with underserved communities whom youth sports is really critical. It's collaboration with different institutions and boys and girls clubs and YMCAs and other types of organizations who are tangentially involved in youth sports. It's, it's, it's collaboration with different school boards and you know, teachers and other folks who, who are involved because when you think about collaboration, it needs to be done in a holistic manner. And so what I can tell you about you know, having worked in government and, and having been at Lyft is that there are a whole host of both grass tops and grassroots people who you need to be working with. You know, if I think about youth sports, I think grassroots are the parents and the consumers and people who are directly involved, the referees and, and, and all those folks who are organizing the events. When I think about grass tops, I think about who are the influential folks in these communities in those various groups who really can help move the ball forward in a safe, in a practical, in an efficient uh, manner, knowing that you want the effects of, of opening up these sports to help an array of people, not just a small percent of folks. Yeah. So th and th there's a couple of things that I think are really applicable here. One is I hear you saying, be able to tell your story in terms of the consequences, the drunk driving analogy that you used in Austin, right? Skip just walked through and, and the Aspen Institute provide a lot of this data as well, which is here is what the consequences are of kids not playing sport, especially right now, or not having access to it, or not having access to equity, the mental health, the physical health implications. So telling that story all of a sudden has them think about safety in a different lens, right? What are the risks that they're not thinking about? The second thing I hear you saying is that um, as you approach these kinds of institutions, um, 
the thinking about the broad set of stakeholders you can bring to the table because that is what government's going to pay attention to right so if it's just a set of organizations that are in the business of running you sports it's a lot less less effective if it doesn't include all the different sectors and all the different players as you said grass tops and grassroots and what skip is representing is all the governing bodies seem to be willing partners to be pulled into any given city to kind of weigh in and provide that influence as partners in this and again we can talk about the COVID situation but then beyond the, the, the thing I want to press you on a little bit is defining the allies, right? I remember when I was trying to deal with it in the New York stuff and trying to figure out who to work with as, as Andrew, and you'll hear the leadership team Meredith had. So I ended up sending emails and texts to a few city council people I knew. And some of it was trying to figure out like this guy's innovative. Some of it was like this guy's arrival of the mayor. So this may be something he'll jump in. What were the mindset that you had to try to find those allies? You know, what advice would you give uh, for someone to build those kinds of relationships, especially if they've not really dealt with government before? Mayor's office, city councils, commissioners, you name it. Yeah, I think, well, first, I think there needs to be recognition that in policy and politics, there the storytelling is really important. And the story that you tell sometimes, you know, internally when you're talking to these officials um, is different than the story that you're going to be telling the public. There is going to be overlap, but there's going to be some groups who are going to be, um, you know, more influential with a city council member or a mayor than they will be explaining the story to the public, I think is one. I think second, you should be thinking broadly about who this coalition is. You know, off the cuff, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, you should be thinking about all different sports. People should be thinking about all different kinds of communities, genders, different types of minority communities, um, you know, who will be involved, you know, in and who would benefit from sports. I think the other one that we found to be really interesting was um, older Americans. So there was a conception that people who were older weren't necessarily using the apps um, and weren't as adept at using the apps. And we actually found that to not to be true. The folks who are older, actually, it was really critical for people to be able to use these apps. In fact, we ended up partnering with a whole bunch of care facilities where people were then using Lyft to get to doctor's appointments, people who couldn't drive anymore. Um, in the accessibility space, you know, there was, there was in, in the beginning, um, I think there was some antagonism from folks in the accessibility space around, these are people's cars, are they equipped to help people, especially people who may have some mobility uh, um, uh, issues? What we found was that people in the accessibility space, when you think about it more broadly, people who had developmental disabilities, people who were blind, people who had uh, hearing disabilities, ride sharing was a game changer for them. Taxis were not, did not have the type of compassion. You did yeah. not have the on-demand app. And so, you know, you can think about different communities whom, you know, league apps and youth sports are helping in a way that you had not actually foreseen. And you will find allies um, who in the beginning, you may have thought we were antagonistic. And the last thing I'll say, Jeremy, is that, you know, one of the entities who we are now very close with and are partnering with is public transit. Public transit had this fear that ride sharing is going to come in and it's going to decimate public transit. Well, actually, in San Francisco, one third of all the rides, and this is pre, um, pre-COVID, but a third of all the rides in San Francisco were first mile and last mile. They were literally people taking lifts to go to public transit or from public transit going home. And so- yeah. Yeah, there's, I it's, think there's a lot of lessons learned there. Yeah, and I think there's such good stuff there, especially because, you know, this, the idea of the, the storytelling, the idea to think more broadly about all the stakeholders, obviously, we're a technology company, we're trying to weigh in where we could, you've got business leaders whose kids are in programs that played youth sports themselves, you've got pro athletes, you've got, so that as you're trying to advocate, and I know California, for example, there's a big effort right now to try to open up the ways the government's thinking about doing that the more, more comprehensive you can think about all the different stakeholders, especially those that government is designed to pay attention to, right? Ideally, those that are marginalized, right? Those that are coming from underserved communities, those that have disabilities, being able to make sure that they have voices and you're thinking about them is, 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 a, critical, is a critical lesson as well. Um, last, last question, Mike, as, as last couple of questions is, is you think a little bit about the, the best practices of kind of relationship building, right? Like, were there tricks that you learned to kind of get on the good side of like, how much is politics versus the policy, right? Because there's what's right. And then there's the idea that these, they want to get elected, right? Or they want to get appointed. And so, you know, where does the media come in as pressure? Where does a petition come in as pressure? What, what are the things that you do to try to influence and get in the mindset of how they make decisions, leaving aside if you think you're on the right for policy? Yeah, I think, well, again, I think first, if there is an ethos and spirit of wanting to collaborate, uh, I think that's really, really important. I think there are other folks in the technology sector who don't necessarily believe in that ethos. There's more of a libertarian bend. We're going to just move forward and fast and not care about government. And I think that those folks will plateau 
I think if you look at any industry right now, future of, you know, biotech, future of health tech, education, food, um, fintech, every one of these new industries is going to have to figure out how to collaborate with government. And if you don't know how to collaborate with government, I think your success will be uh, hampered. Um, so I think that that that's number one, really important. Number two, I think when you have a compelling story that consumers can tell, uh, and in the case of ride sharing, it was very compelling because in a place like San Francisco, where again, public transit does not connect the whole city, it's really, really hard to get a taxi. And when you look at the data of travel and tourism, the number one issue tourists in San Francisco had before ride sharing was getting a cab to be able to go out. Um, when you have these voices that are saying, hey, don't take this away, um, you know, that, that's really powerful. And when you then, and when you combine that um, with data, and I think data and research is really, really important. So I think about like a Brookings Institute, and I think about reports that they, you know, had worked on in terms of cities and transportation infrastructure in cities and how critical that was for not just travel and tourism, but for the economic viability and vitality of a city. Um, having a research partner, I think, is really important. And the fact is, you know, what you and Skip were just talking about in terms of the effects on mental health, um, the long-term effects of not having sports in, in, in a wide array of communities, that kind of data is very compelling, not just for policymakers, but it's compelling when you tell the story to the broader public and when you arm your consumers with that kind of data combined with their, you know, lived experiences. Um, I think people, people are forced to listen. Yeah, and just to press you uh, for just a quick answer on this, which is, look, it, it's you, you can do all those things, but at the end of the day, you can also enter the calculations of how the politicians are viewing this, right? There's a lot of people that's advocating for it. They're thinking in terms of their vote and their election. It, does media or donors, are there ways to thinking about, like, if you know someone is a big supporter of someone, if you know that there's media that you could call attention to it, how do you think about using that strategically as we're about to jump into the case study? Well, again, I think you need to be very mindful about the conversations that you're having externally uh, and the conversations that you're having internally. And I can tell you that like, you know, in the case of Austin for us, it was one city council member and she was none too happy when things were happening externally. Uh, and all we could have done, you know, not us, but in, as an industry was have more honest conversations with her instead of dragging it through the press. Um, on the other hand, you know, there are, we live in, in, in a culture now where you do have influencers and folks who can utilize social media, especially if you're talking about mobilizing the youth uh, in a way that would pressure different policymakers who may not want to listen to you and who may be sort of stuck in a position. And so I think the power now of using social media and, you know, you learn from folks like Move On who, who signed petitions. Now it's not just about signing petitions, it's about you know, you could even get like a celebrity sports figure who has millions of followers to say, hey, you know, there's a great policy here to open up youth sports with safety regulations. Like I, I, you know, join me in helping to persuade X, Y, or Z, or join me in a movement to open up sports. In a, again, I think you need to folk, figure out where your talking points are in terms of safety and what are the foundational elements. But you can imagine, you know, someone like that, um, you know, at Lyft, we, we did partner with LeBron James um, around bike share access. And I will say like someone like a LeBron James, you know, when he tweets something out, politicians all across the country are listening because he's got millions and millions of followers and those are constituents. Yeah. And so don't underestimate the power of utilizing social media in, in tech, helping with that narrative. But I do think you have to be very smart about what that message is and make sure that that message is aligned with you know, the message around safety and other things, because you can very easily, you know, derail that message if it's just about like passion. And, and again, in sports, people have a lot, of, I have a lot of passion, um, right. Yeah, but there's a lot of passion and you don't want to let passion overpower um, some of the practical elements that you're dealing with. So I'm going to, I'm going to break this down. And you're going to tell me how I did in terms of my homework. As you lay this all out, here's what I see that every organization can take from the Mike Masterman School of how to engage local governments with all the experience at Lyft and in the, uh, the Obama administration. One, first, make sure you know your story and make that story uh, based on data, make that story based on potentially evidence of here's what's happened in New York or here's what's happened in other places as, as cities have opened back up, especially with youth sports. If you come in with that data, you come in with those examples, that matters a lot and people understand what it is that, it, and then not losing sight of the fact that you're rooting this in issues that matter. So equity, access, right? Mental health, physical health, well-being. Get your story straight. The second thing is, is know who you're targeting in government. 
find, figure out who your could be allies is and understand kind of what it is that, that, that they, if they can be influential in the decision, what's going to move the needle. They might want to work behind the scenes. They may be someone you need to pressure outside, but you've got to be really specific and understanding like where, where that influence matters. The third thing I heard you say is take a spirit of collaboration with government, right? They're not, if you go out and say you're the enemy, they're not going to be as responsive as you say, hey, we want to work with you to make the right decision. We're going to let you know that people care about it. There might be some outside pressure. At the end of the day, how can we help you met, get to the right decision that's best for our community? And then the fourth thing is a broad-based coalition, not just youth sports organizations, not just the governing bodies at the tops, but thinking more broadly. It's your parents, right? It's the other stakeholders. It's the t-shirt vendors that care about youth sports, right? It's the, the other people that are invested in this. It's the coaches, it's the referees, the technology companies. Uh, it's the folks that are working with folks with disabilities or focusing with nonprofits. The more that you can broaden it, the better it would be. How'd I do? You crushed it. I'd say the, the only thing I would add to that, Jeremy, is within the scope of the spirit of collaboration, I think also just approaching it with compassion and empathy. I mean, you know, people, I think, want these sports to come back. And again, there's going to be lots of different feelings and people are human and sometimes you can't control how people are, are going to feel. And so having empathy on both sides, I think on the government official side and on, you know, from, from the youth sports side, uh, I think that's, that's important. It, it's, an important note to end, it's an important note to end on. And I think the other thing I'd say is this is, it's, a, it's not just the short term, hey, we have a need and then I'm walking away. There's a strategic opportunity. And as you said, every industry, including the emerging youth sports industry is gonna have to figure out how to work with government. Whether it means that government local budgets are being crushed and collapsed, and therefore they're gonna need outsourced programs and they need partners for that. Whether that means they're gonna be able to access the $900 million of new annual grants to go into recreation spaces that they could collaborate with you on to create more places for you. Whether that means that there are grants that could go to more community organizations uh, as people are thinking about shifting funds from pure policing to more community-based approaches. There are all kinds of opportunities and challenges. So if you don't have a plan in your community with organizations to navigate it, you're going to miss that opportunity. Certainly, that's a role that at League Apps we want to continue to play. Mike Masterman, thank you for being with us today. It's great seeing you, buddy. And, uh, and thanks for your expertise and perspective. Uh, we see why Lyft had the success it did. Uh, I know uh, I was expecting to see you with the mustache, but uh, I guess you hung that up. So thanks again for being here. Uh, and we'll uh, see you, buddy. Perfect. Bye. Um, We'll uh, bring in our last guests uh, today um, to really kind of put a fine point in this. And they bring real specific expertise because they've had success in doing this, especially in New York City with an incredible success story. So Andrew and Meredith, welcome. And one thing I'll say is if there are questions that people have as we go, feel free to post in the Q&A tab. Uh, I imagine Andrew and, uh, and Meredith, as you listen to the conversation, some of the stuff was like, oh yeah, we figured that stuff out um, as we went or... Um, certainly have things to add. Uh, but Andrew, uh, you are the executive director of South Franks United. Uh, it's a, a great nonprofit organization uh, that is focused on, on education, mentoring, community development, and soccer all kind of brought together. I think over a thousand uh, boys and girls are involved in your programs. I know uh, we're on our league apps to, to be supportive of the program through our fun play program. And then Meredith, uh, you are the commissioner of the West Side Soccer League uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and oversee a massive empire on the West Side in terms of soccer. Uh, and, uh, and what I think you guys are here for is uh, you had to respond to what was happening uh, in New York City. So maybe, Andrew, set the stage for us. What was going on in New York uh, that caused you to launch, launch this effort? Uh, and, uh, and then we'll talk about a little bit about what we learned from success and what you thought of what, what some of the speakers said. Sure. Yeah, and thanks so much for uh, having me here. Um, yeah, so go back about a, a month, um, obviously through the spring and, and the summer, we'd been uh, having most of our, our kids uh, sitting at home um wishing they were outside and, and getting a chance to to play and stay physically and, and mentally fit um by the summer by midsummer we saw the um rates where were definitely dropping uh, the covid infection rates were dropping a lot in new york city i think we're looking pretty good there was a push to begin opening the schools back up um uh restaurants being open and and things like that so um we were we were all prepared to get get um our kids back out on the soccer field and give them a chance to to start playing again um and, and we knew from from staying in touch with, with all of them how important this was to, to them and, and to parents um and then it was around uh uh mid-august as, as we were preparing for our, our fall season and i'm thinking um we we'd be ready to go that that we got an email um in our inbox that the New York City Parks Department said they were not going to issue any field permits for the fall season. Um, so that really uh, was a possibility. It, it took us by surprise seeing, seeing the direction that most of the things were going in, in the city. 
and and really the need for for youth to be playing, especially when we knew there's already a push to be opening schools from the city that that um, uh, that we thought the kids really need to be outside, and and, and also knowing that um, the parks were already open and there was a lot of uh, lack of enforcement um, in the parks that we felt having programs could could really help with. So with that, um, when, when we found that out, um, got on the phone with a bunch of folks and got connected with Meredith and and we jumped on it right away and said, you know, this 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 isn't okay. This isn't going to work for for our communities. Um, put together a petition and a letter addressed to the mayor and the parks commissioner. Got that out um, the same late the same evening that we saw the, um, the announcement, and then we started to to get a group of organizations. Um, started within soccer, but but broadened uh, as well. A group of organizations together to, to discuss how what we would do as as next steps to to overturn that decision. When um so Meredith, maybe to jump in uh, and and first of all, what what seems so off about the decision? And when you all jumped in, obviously we we want to do what's safe for kids, but there was also something about the way that the, the government approached this that that led to you kind of jumping into this effort. So so what was it that you assessed that that you know, how government even made this decision and what that decision was about that led you all to say, hey, we've really got to kind of challenge that. Well, I think our understanding was there had been, you know, we had it from some of the parks commissioners that there had been an incident with a certain, there had been publicity around a certain baseball league that over the summer had not been, um, even though they had a bunch of protocols in place, they had not been um, following their own protocols. And I think parents within that league were upset they had brought that to the mayor's attention. I, I think there was an article written the day before the email came out about the letters. And our understanding was that the new um, health commissioner that the mayor had was very concerned um, about youth sports and, and youth possibly being um, asymptomatic transmitters. And so that really led to their decision. But I, you know, in talking among the various leagues, the real issue was we could, just because one league wasn't great at enforcing it, didn't mean the rest of us wouldn't be. And that certainly we were in a much better position to enforce safety protocols and to insist upon wearing face coverings and social distancing and taking other measures like health screenings and in a position to do that and actually screen than if you just left the parks open for people to use the fields. And I think that that was just a misunderstanding at by the mayor's office of, you know, sort of that who, you know, being able, what was safest for the kids. So Andrew, it doesn't seem quite as simple as to say that they were like, oh yeah, we made a mistake. Let's, let's just change it. Right. It took a little effort on your part, right. Even to get to that, that point, uh, as Mayor's pointing out, because it, as the parks were still open and people could still use them and the people using them presumably were taking less precautions than the organizations that probably were taking temperatures and had protocols and, and requirements and coaches and masks or gloves or whatever the case may be. Um, so what, what, what did you, how did you actually, so if you put yourself in the shoes of anyone that's listening around the country that are figuring out like, how do I take this approach? Uh, what were the things that you did to be successful and maybe connecting that back to some of the things that we heard from, from Skip and, and from Mike? Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's a few prongs here. I think, um, first was getting a group organization that were really passionate. I think this is a really concrete issue, just open provide field permits is, is, is as simple as that. And, and we had a, a network of organizations connecting with, with Mayor of the West Side Soccer League, but and then we had over 100, uh, we had 122 organizations endorsed um, the letter that were representing over 60,000 youth um, in the city. So um, getting all of them together and starting to have that conversation and, and thinking who, what connections did, did everyone have um, that could start to get, get us in front of the, the, the mayor, in front of government officials, and then also press. Um, that was that was another big piece. As as uh, we know that in in City Hall, they read uh, they read the Daily News, they read the the Times, they watch uh, watch the news. So as we start to get out there, that also we knew that was also going to catch their eye. Um, so uh, and then the government officials was a really crucial piece. Is is um, uh, connecting with government officials, and getting them to endorse uh, the letter. We had uh, within. The, one week we had 12 elected officials that had endorsed the letter and and, and that wasn't through my efforts directly um, Meredith made connections we had uh, groups in, in Brooklyn made connections Staten Island made connections so um, it was taking advantage of the full uh, uh, coalition of, of organizations and seeing who had those connections to to people that they could get in front of and, and get to 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 sign it and 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 help get in front of the the mayor and the parks commissioner
Yeah, so to break that down a little bit, Meredith, I, one thing is in terms of the government officials, uh, was it a kind of thing where people are like, oh yeah, I, I know exactly who I know, let's go. Like, how did you actually figure out who to target? It seems like you're, you're, you embrace kind of Mike's feeling like, let's be collaborative, let's find people that wanna be involved in this that be, that, and be supportive of this. So, so what did you learn about the, the way to approach government officials, especially if that's not a relationship you may have had already that was pretty close? So I, I wanna touch back because I think it, it, some of the points he made were very important. So I do agree that an empathetic approach and a we work together approach is a better um, tactic than going at them adversarially. I mean, it, it certainly, I think brought them into the fold faster than if we had just sort of attacked this, what kind of crazy decision is this, right? We kind of said, we understand where you're coming from, but here's why it was a mistake, right? Or you, you should think about these other things you haven't thought about. Um, in terms of actually contacting the government officials, we have 4,000 families in our soccer league. That was a great resource. And we're just by size alone um, able to have you know, parents who many of them work for some of these government officials, or they work in media and they work for ABC or NBC, it allowed us access that maybe other people wouldn't have. Um, we also, someone had put us in touch because they work for a public, uh, a political advocacy group, and that group worked with us and they were instrumental in helping us identify where and how to direct our efforts and what we should say. And I think that was a a very um, helpful uh, thing to have, a, a group to have to provide that guidance. Um, and the other thing I wanna say is, you know, collaboration was ultra important too. The fact that all of the organizations came together that each of us, on the soccer side, once we got the soccer groups together, then had contacts, all of us had different contacts, right? Depending geographically where we were, but then to bring all those groups in together to form this, you know, 110 strong plus, you know, group that, you know, discusses issues. And I think frankly, we'll stay together going forward as issues prop up. That was a tremendous effort. And I think that also made a difference along with all of those groups bringing social media pressure, because I do think what got the mayor's attention is the constant barragement by the parents of each group to then pay attention to the fact that he was being called out. And, and I think that that made him, how it ultimately I think came to resolution was yes, all of our efforts brought some pressure, but ultimately the mayor reached out to someone he knew to then reach out to us to say, hey, let me understand what's going on. Can you put this together? And I think that was as a result of the media pressure, the social media pressure and the advocacy. Um, it was not easy to be honest for this group to get some of the public officials to buy on. And why do I think that is, is because the, the fact that um, uh, was mentioned earlier that Mike mentioned the fear factor, right? No one wants to be responsible for putting back and saying, yes, let's get them back out playing and then having something happen and having an outbreak or a cluster in one of the groups that they then put back out on the field. So I think there was this fear factor and getting them over the fear that there is safety in numbers. And once, as Andrew said, we got some officials on board, then the others kind of all came in line very quickly. Yeah, there's, there's so much there to unpack. And, and obviously part of the bigger message is there's a, it's a thoughtful, comprehensive approach. Uh, but that also, as you build that muscle, you, you, as you mentioned, you can use that moving forward. You know, Andrew, one, one aspect that Mike spoke about that I think is also part of what Mara's talking about is the storytelling here, right? That this was not purely about like, let us have access to the spaces, but there was also a lens around like why this mattered, right? And who was impacted by it. That hopefully to, to Meredith's point has to offset this question of fear because otherwise you're like, if one kid gets sick, it's not worth it. That's my mindset. So you had to provide an alternative to say, no, 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 like if you don't do this, there's actually real consequences as well. What, what, what was that story that you were focusing on? What was the argument that you were able to make around data or examples? or messaging that, that was really important um, to get people on board? Yeah, I think, I mean, for, for me, uh, representing South Bronx United and in the community here, um, we felt this was a, a, really a, a equity issue. And then we really uh, uh, pushed that a lot for, for kids that they don't, um, they don't have the opportunities and the resources to leave the city, to join other camps and other programs and other, parts of the state that that have a bunch of outdoor areas um they're they're here and and um, there's already a lack of park space a lot, lot lack of open space when you do go to the parks they're already full for so for a kid to get a chance uh to play it's, it's really tough um so from from our perspective that's that's something we really push and i, I know a lot of other organizations help that helps as well and i think that's something you, you know your elected officials and you know um, the mayor, but but certainly that the that, that equity is something that that is important uh, uh, to to the city and to the mayor. I, I think um, so. I, I think that 
that made a difference and, and but also made it just so important for us that this wasn't just about it wasn't just about playing sports it was about having equal access is about the physical and mental health and social emotional health of of our kids who've been stuck inside for um seven seven months and 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 uh and we knew that um as i said things were were opening up already um schools were trying to open up and, and uh physical and, and mental health and fitness are really a crucial part of that yeah and it, it seems that the if, I mean, part of it is just understanding the audience, right? As you mentioned, the, the mayor is someone who's very focused on questions of equity and access. So being able to position things as part of that was a way of making that message resonate. I know there's some questions we'll get to in a second in San Francisco. Uh, certainly the, 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 the political leadership there, that, that would be an important issue to advance and a, a sincere one at that. Um, Meredith, when you talk about collaboration, it seems like enlisting parents was a big part of this, working mm -hmm. with other organizations. Was it easy to go to your parents? Is that something you've done before? Like, how, what advice do you have for about that? And and also in terms of working with organizations, it sounded like there was a broad base, some of which you probably compete with for players and things like that. Any, any advice or tips around how to, to think about going both the parents into working with other organizations? So um, first, let me take the latter part of the question because that's easier, which is some of these organizations, we are competitors. They meet each other on the weekends on the soccer fields and fiercely competitive. But, you know, at the same time, we had a united goal and that was the physical and mental well-being of the children. And I think we all felt and agreed upon that, that this was necessary for them after six months of being shut in, they needed to be able to get out and they need to do it in an organized way because if they didn't do it in an organized way, that was going to cause greater safety issues than if we came together and worked together to promote a common good. And I think so that that made it easy on that front. And then in terms of the parents for us, for Westside Soccer League, and I think Andrew had the same experience with South Bronx United, we are used to going to our parents for things. We are a not-for-profit community soccer league. So for us, we rely, we're all volunteers volunteer run. So we rely on our parents for coaches, for referees, for everything. So it, it's not unusual. Like when we needed PPE, we went to our parents, you know, for, for sourcing. I, I think for us, it's very much a grassroots organization. And, and we therefore are, have a good collaborative relationship with our parents as well. And we also have a good collaborative relationship most of the time with our elected officials on the Upper West Side. Um, I, you know, so that provided a good framework to work within. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, and it's probably a broader lesson. Whatever the structure of your organization, nonprofit, for profit, whatever, like youth sports parents are always a challenge. But you got to bring them into the solution. You got to figure out how to be collaborative with them. And to your point, in moments like this, it becomes really powerful. And you know, you, you can think about the restaurants in New York City that are struggling and having a hard time. It's harder. You know, they don't have a built-in constituency in the same way that you do as parents of an organization. So how you leverage that, uh, Andrew? One one of the questions that came in is just actually what actually got approved. Was it youth and adult? Is it being able to play games or just practice? What was what was the actual model there that people might be able to point other cities to? Yeah, we we are uh, coach and push for youth, the return of uh, programs for youth and children. Uh, we did have adult programs that endorsed uh, and, and signed on, and and I know that those efforts are still ongoing. Um, but I think it was important for us to first of all push for the well-being of our kids. Um, so that's what was approved was for the turn of field permits for um, youth programs. And uh, there's, there was certain um, uh, affirmation and documentation that we had to, uh, every organization had to sign off on saying that, that you were taking certain precautions. Um, we personally, I know Meredith at Westside Soccer Lake had their have, have really detailed safety plans as well um, that even went beyond what the city and the Parks Department was requiring. And you could, you, was it games or practice with the restrictions, Meredith, on games practices? There was no right? restrictions on specifically on, on games or practices, and this was uh, multi-sport, but but I think no um, no football, for example. Uh, there's there's some limitations like that on the type of sport. Excellent. Um, Meredith, I'll let you ask answer the final question, then I'll wrap, which is, um, you mentioned this, you built this kind of model. So if, if, if one is, what would you, what might we use it for in the future, right? Hopefully we'll get past COVID. But what is the value now of coming together and collaborating and advocating? What, what do you see the value of that is? Well, I think it's just a great mechanism for us all to keep talking and discussing issues. You know, recently, another, you know, one of the topics that's actually part of the question too is this issue of whether they should wear face coverings on the field. So that's something that, you know, we've had a bunch of emails going back and forth this morning about all sharing information because I think they're, you know, that's a hotly debated issue. Um, and in New York City, to answer the question, they're not mandating them on the field. They are, and I think the WHO guidance is not to wear them. So that's where I think we all are right now 
but I think there's a question. We at Westside Soccer League, and Andrew, I don't remember what you guys are doing, but we recommend them. We, you know, if the child can tolerate it, which I think is what the CDC says, but we're not mandating them. And I think having this coalition to go to when questions like this come up, and we've seen a recent surge of schools um, sending out letters to their parents asking them not to play sports unless they're wearing these face coverings 100% of the time, you know, we're able to then respond to the schools, again, with the power of the group behind us, and not just sort of individual responses. And I think that, yeah. you know, that's helpful. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to convince the schools of anything, but <laughs> it's helpful right. to have that that sounding board to, to talk to and discuss things with. Yeah, and I, and I think the overwhelming message is, is that the engagement interaction with government is here to stay. Hopefully COVID will not be here to stay. But the idea of how we're working constructively, whether it's uh, addressing any of the issues or opportunities, I think is important. And, and I think one of the convictions that we've always had at League Apps, why we built this next up community was just the belief that authority comes bottoms up. And there's a critical role that Skip and the national governing bodies have, but there's such an important role for the people that are closest to the situation in local communities. And so working together and not getting together, there's strength in numbers and power in that. And that's certainly a core belief we have. Uh, thank you all for joining us, Andrew Mayer. Thank you for your leadership on behalf of all those in New York City uh, who have parents, have parents and kids like myself. Uh, and uh, we appreciate all you've done. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation, have more questions, check out our industry Slack group, uh, and we can uh, also put you in touch with, with Andrew Merritt if you want any other examples uh, that you can pull into what you're doing in your local area. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, have thank a great you. day. Thank you. Appreciate you.